Okay, our final talk of the session is from Sophia Jansiopoulou, and she's going to talk about object capabilities. Thank you for letting me talk at this uh, uh, workshop about a slightly uh, related, but I think uh, relevant uh, uh, question, which is how do we reason about code that uses object capabilities? This is work that we did, uh, we have been doing for several years now with James, who is uh, sitting there, Susan Eisenbach and uh, Julian McKay, who are not here. And uh, at uh, earlier versions, we have been collaborating with Mark Miller and Toby Murray. Um, the aim of this uh, work is to understand uh, what uh, object capabilities are trying to, to do and how do we use object capabilities in order to uh, reason about the code. Um, I'll, I'll go back. Object capabilities uh, are uh, um, how uh, Mark Miller reflects the idea of uh, capabilities as they appeared for architectures and operating systems. Uh, so uh, Mark set himself uh, the task to introduce object capabilities into programming languages. He developed the programming language E and then uh, his ideas were uh, also reflected in uh, uh, ECMAScript. Um, so what is our research question? Um, we want to reason about uh, uh, how internal trusted objects, the internal trusted objects are the green objects, they are written by in our code, we know stuff about them, but those internal trusted objects, they need to uh, collaborate with uh, uh, objects that are from an unknown uh, external uh, um, um, developer, so they are the, the pink uh, objects. They need to collaborate with each other, but we still want to know that some nice properties are going to be preserved. And we want to do that using object capabilities. Uh, what are object capabilities? The literature uh, says things like a capability describes a transferable right to perform one or more operations, uh, these capabilities, they are references, they cannot be forged, and they can be transferred to one another, from one object to another, either through messages or through creation. Uh, in uh, ob object capability speak, there is no ambient uh, authority. Uh, so this is what the literature says. What we found over those years is that uh, the capabilities are necessary conditions, so they are not the only rights to perform something, they are necessary in order for something to happen, and they are necessary conditions for effects, not for operations. Moreover, it is important to track uh, who has got access to capabilities. Uh, I'm going to give an example and, uh, which uh, motivates the work, and then there are four challenges. Some of you might have seen the example in the past. So we have got uh, uh, three modules. Uh, the first module is a good module, and uh, what it does is a module for payments. So I have got a class account. The account has got uh, two fields, balance and password. You can transfer money from one account to another provided you have uh, given the right password and you can initialize your account. So if the, the, the password is null, then you can set the password. But then you cannot change the password any further. Moreover, we assume that uh, uh, the architecture or the programming language is, a programming, is capability safe in the sense of, uh, in this model, or the methods are public and the fields are private. So that means you can only mo access the fields if you come from the same module. You cannot mo uh, access them otherwise. Uh, here is another version of the module. It is the bad version, and it differs from the other one. It is a copy and paste of the other one with the difference that uh, in, you can now set the password uh, uh, without any precondition. You don't need to have the... Uh, you, you can, it does not need to be uh, null. And there is a better version of the account and the difference uh, of, of the module. And the difference is that in order to set the password, you need to know the uh, old password. 
So obviously, the good and the better modules are the modules that we would like to have, and we would like this one to fail, some criterion, because with this one, what you can do is you take the account, you change its password, and you take all the money out of the account without uh, any knowledge of anything about uh, uh, the, um, the account. So the first challenge is to find a specification language that would allow me to write uh, specifications, S in the particular case, so that uh, the good and the better module satisfy the specification and the bad mod module doesn't. The second uh, challenge is to find an inference algorithm with uh, which we can indeed uh, prove that the good and the better module uh, satisfy the specification. And uh, with this inference algorithm, it should be impossible to prove that the bad module satisfies the specification. The third challenge is this inference algorithm. This inference system should be algorithmic. I should have a, a, a semi-decidable uh, system. And in order to introduce the fourth challenge, well, the fourth challenge is reason about uh, uh, unknown code, about uh, calls to uh, external uh, functions. So here we have got um, an example where I have uh, a further module, uh, a client. Uh, it has got a cautious method to which I am passing an untrusted argument. The untrusted is of class object. I know nothing about this untrusted. And within that method, I create a mo um, an account. I initialize the password. I put perhaps some money into uh, that account. And then on line eight, I have got an external call. What I'm doing is I am calling the method meth make payment on untrusted and I'm passing my account. So what I'm hoping is that this untrusted is going to uh, put some money into my account. But what I need to prevent is that uh, they take my account and take money out of it. And indeed, if the account comes from a good module, the one that satisfies this uh, specification that I want to uh, talk about later on. And if on the line seven here, I did not leak the password to external objects, then after the call, I know I have got the certainty that the balance of my account has not decreased. Perhaps, and hopefully it has increased, but it definitely has not uh, uh, decreased. So the fourth challenge is we want to have an infinite system so that we can prove external calls. We have seen several such uh, uh, talks uh, earlier, of course, but uh, uh, in the end I can discuss uh, the difference uh, between what we have so far and what we have seen, what we have and what we have seen so far. Right, so the first challenge. We want to find, to have a specification language that allows us to distinguish between the good and the bad uh, uh, modules. Right, so remember the capability represents a transferable right to perform one or more operations on a given object. Going back to our example with the account, what can we do? We could say, ah, the password enables withdrawal from the account. And then, of course, I can go and say, how do I write this formally? But that's not very good because um, what if I have a uh, other ways of uh, making with, with the withdrawal. Perhaps I have got a magic word that I can pass when I say withdrawal. So um, I can be sure that if I have the password, I can withdraw. But what I want to be sure is that uh, without the password, the withdrawal will fail. Mm, that's not very good either, because it could be that uh, uh, as well as a withdrawal method, there was another method that allowed me to reduce the, the balance, something that went through all the accounts and took 10% off and sent it to the inland revenue or uh, whatever. So what we want to say is that the effect of the balance uh, decreasing will not happen unless we have the password. So that is the correct specification. And uh, what it means is that uh, for all <coughs> statements, uh, 
in whole logic uh, speak. But for all statements, uh, if we do not have the password and the balance is of a certain value, and we then execute that statement, afterwards the uh, balance will be uh, greater or equal to the original value. And this beautiful uh, uh, representation, succinct representation, took us a couple of years to uh, get to, I'm afraid, and uh, I'm, I'm, I must mention that uh, Nikos Papaspiru, in some discussion with us, uh, helped us uh, distill uh, our thoughts. Um, so the motto that we are following is the capability is a necessary condition for some effect. Uh, now, how do we write that? Uh, the, the way that we will be uh, expressing this formally is through these uh, uh, patterns, which are uh, actually invariants, with a little bit of uh, special uh, uh, two-state invariants, with a little bit of uh, special flavor. So the general uh, uh, shape of those uh, specifications is... Uh, Uh, a prime. Um, so now we have got two further challenges. One is what does it mean for a password to be protected? Here I, I express without a password, a password, a password is protected. And the other challenge is what is the semantics of those uh, uh, two state uh, specifications, the invariant specifications. Uh, about the first challenge, uh, remember that what we are uh, looking at is how do the internal trusted objects interact with uh, external untrusted objects. So we define that an object is protected from another object uh, uh, O prime if any path from O prime to O goes through some internal object. Here is an example. I have got external objects uh, uh, one and five and internal objects the green one. Four, six, seven, uh, and uh, we can uh, observe that O3 is protected from O1, 4 is protected from 1, but it is not uh, protected from uh, 5. Um, and uh, if we want to consider whether an object is protected, um, what we require is that uh, uh, an object is protected if it is protected from any external object accessible from the top frame. So in this example, the external objects accessible from the top frame are 1 and 5, and therefore, the, so this is uh, the top frame, uh, 3 is a protected object. The other objects are not protected. If we push one frame onto the stack, like uh, here, uh, where I have pushed uh, this uh, uh, frame. Now, the set of uh, external objects that are accessible is smaller, and there are more objects that are protected. OK, so this is the meaning of uh, protected. It's about uh, what access the external objects can get to um, the, the protected object, whether they can get uh, access and uh, whether those objects are accessible from the top frame. So the issue is we want to track access to the capabilities. The other question is, what is the meaning of these uh, two state specifications? So a module uh, satisfies uh, this uh, specification if, first of all, we need to consider uh, what states are relevant. So we look at the states that arise from execution of a module combined, this particular module, combined with any module uh, M prime, and then all globally accessible objects that are of this particular class, and uh, all future states uh, sigma prime that arise from execution from the current uh, state sigma, if uh, sigma satisfies the assertion A, then sigma prime satisfies the assertion A prime. So looking at uh, uh, the, um, 
such an example where we say if X is protected and it satisfies assertion A, then in all future states it will be satisfying A as well. Uh, and looking at the guarantee for this configuration, uh, what it says is that uh, the um, um, Property A will be preserved for the object O3, because that's the only protected object. So in all future states from that configuration, uh, 3 will have the uh, property A if it has it now. On the other hand, if we consider the other con uh, uh, configuration, where we have got one more frame, then the property will be preserved for more objects. Uh, something to remember is that uh, when we push frames onto the stack, more objects, fewer objects uh, become locally accessible because we have what we push onto uh, the next uh, frame is a subset of what was uh, locally accessible in the current frame. And as a result, more objects are protected. And that will help us uh, with the reasoning later on. Um, if I look at uh, a possible specification for uh, uh, the good uh, uh, module and the better module, uh, I have got it here. So the first line says that if an account is protected, it remains protected. The second says if the password is protected, then it remains protected. Uh, the third says is the pass if the account is protected and the uh, balance has got a certain value, then in the future it will always have the same certain value. And the last says that the, if the password is protected and the balance has got a certain value, then in the future it will have a value that is uh, greater or equal to the current value. Um, so there are a couple of things to notice. The first one is that the specification is API agnostic. We're talking about effects. We don't talk about the particular functions that are uh, exported by uh, the module. Uh, the, and the, the last um, thing to notice is that uh, the specification make promises about the emergent behavior. So uh, the, the, the problems that can happen between that state and that state, they can involve several internal calls to the module. I can call payment method, a set password method, a give me uh, my uh, statement uh, uh, method, uh, make, a, uh, make another person an owner, and so on and so on. Here, I have got any number of calls in between, and therefore, we are talking about emergent behavior. Okay, so second challenge is an inference system so that uh, it satisfies uh, so that I can check that uh, the good uh, and the better module satisfy the specification. Uh, and this, uh, in the presence of any number of nested calls from uh, internal to uh, external objects. So here I have got a state which calls an external object, that calls an external object, which again calls an internal object, and so on and so on. Right. Uh, in order to, uh, to make progress, we need the concept of an encapsulated assertion. And this is an assertion whose validity can only be um, changed by calls into the module itself. So the assertion that uh, some account has got a certain value is encapsulated both in the bad and in the better module. But if I had another module where I had an external a system ledger and anybody could modify the ledger, then the assertion would not be encapsulated. And the question is, how can we prove that this model satisfies such a specification? Um, if indeed the assertion is encapsulated, what we need to do is find all the public Uh, preserve the assertion A. And then there are forms of weakening, strengthening, and so on and so on. Uh, then the fourth challenge is how can we prove the external calls? So here I've got a, a method call 
where I'm, I call a function on some object Z, and I know that Z is external. What can I do? And here we have got the motto that we need the, we use capabilities and necessary condition for some effect. So if I know The um, specification of the module, I have made uh, 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 some uh, promise about going from assertion A1 to A2. And, <clears throat> and if I know that the current state A satisfies the preconditions for this uh, invariant, then I know that after the call, A2 will call. So I'm using uh, uh, this uh, specification, and I know that specification. <coughs> Module a couple of things. So I need to lift uh, the assertion for the, from the caller to the colleague and in particular, oops, you see things here that uh, under some conditions I can strengthen things. Uh, more things become, become protected because I am in the colleague frame. Uh, when I come back I have to lower the A2 from the colleague to the caller and moreover I know that uh, because of some further parts of the specification in the module, uh, some parts of A will be preserved. And there is uh, similar parts to the inference system to do with uh, uh, protection, and uh, the motto is tracking the capabilities. Um, right, so at this point I am happy, convinced, and surprised. Uh, as a summary, we distinguish between external and internal objects. We have good specifications that usually have this uh, shape. Uh, if uh, some capability is denied, uh, if something is protected, then some assertion A, then always in the future some assertion A. This assertion A will call. We have this concept of uh, protection, which is about who can access to the, uh, get access to the capability. There are some fine points into the design. So here, when we look at protection, we are looking only from locally relevant objects. When we look at those assertions, we are looking at globally relevant objects. And the future is uh, shallow. We are only looking at what can be called from the current uh, um, stack into the future, but not ever um, uh, returning from the current top uh, of the stack. We have got specifications that are API, agnostic, open calls, and so on. And uh, uh, the state of uh, work is that the proofs are handwritten, but we can, with those handwritten proofs, we can prove soundness and adherence of uh, those, uh, the good modules to the specification. Um, I'm convinced that object capabilities are about necessary conditions for effects. And I think that we should consider them in uh, that way. I was very surprised that uh, we are talking about necessary conditions, but what we do is we reason with sufficient conditions. Andreas Podelski has been telling me that for uh, several years, that every uh, uh, necessary condition has got a, a counterpart to the sufficient condition, but uh, we did not know how to do it, and now uh, we know uh, how to do it, uh, that we did not need uh, temporal logic specifications, and we finally are working with uh, uh, an extension to a whole logic, and uh, some of this uh, we discovered after talking with Julien, uh, um, Jules Verlang, I'm not pronouncing it uh, well, um, uh, last year, so we, uh, we have simplified our approach over the years. And here are the next things uh, I would, we would like to do. But I think I'm running out of time, so I'm stopping. Okay, do we have questions? So you mentioned that you're deriving the specification from the interface of the module. You, you, you must satisfy that all the methods, all the public methods, uh, they have to declare that satisfy the specification. Uh, 
have you thought about having like this by defo reversing this condition and then and making them explicitly by default they have having as a default that they satisfy the specification so by default they deny access to everything because now you have to specify for each of them right so you are saying uh Rather than going and proving the method bodies, uh, every function should be mentioning uh, these uh, uh, right. as, as in the, in the, in the, in, the, in its specific specification. Right. Yes, you could do it, but then you have to, to prove that function. Okay. Yeah. Because if yes. your specification can, say, for example, you have like twenty fields, like not just one balance. 20 balances, the specification become very tedious and you have to specify for each method. That will be but the, the point is that if you have got a module that has got uh, 200 uh, functions, and what you want to do is uh, give some guarantees to uh, the programmer in the specification, you can write a very succinct uh, uh, specification. The proofs, of course, they have to be long, but this is uh, the fate of anybody who works in, uh, in verification. Uh, but if you can give a very small and succinct uh, uh, description, uh, then, uh, uh, th then it's a win. Thank you. So, it, uh, um, very interesting, uh, uh, interesting ideas that, that seem related to many ideas that are floating in the community as well, but I don't know exactly how they are related. So one, one question I have is um, <coughs> whether you don't think it's a disadvantage that you're looking at, at, um, at references in a sort of um, syntactical way, right? So either there's a reference to an object or not. Uh, what if I have access to an object that has access to a different object but doesn't use it? You don't distinguish that case from having access to an object that has access to that second object, but does does use it in its state, right? So, you, so you don't distinguish between there being a reference which is used under certain restrictions and there being a reference which is used with less restrictions. Yeah, uh, this is one. Of, you you are totally right. The, our uh, definition of protection is very syntactic and uh, and uh, very. Uh, and, and weak also, because uh, exactly, uh, you might have a reference that you are not going to use, and w we are very conservative, yeah. But uh, uh, what uh, we hope is that uh, we can improve the definition of protection and still keep the flavor of, uh, of the argument. But wouldn't that mean, I mean, you mentioned a few times that your motto is tracking which capability references are in the system. Wouldn't that mean paying less attention to the references that are there, but more to the sort of semantics of all the objects that are on the, the reference chain? Yes, but I have, on the other hand, don't forget that we can only talk about the semantics of the objects that are, are internal. The external objects we know nothing about. <coughs> so at some point we have to be, as soon as an external object has access to something, it can do whatever and it can give it to any other uh, object. Yeah, but I mean the ones you trust, right? So the semantics yeah. of the objects you trust mm -hmm. on. Yeah. Thank you, Sophia. Um, I wonder if you could um, take care of your external call constraints by using separation logic or some kind of framing condition where you could say that your, your assumptions don't get invalidated. I'm sorry, I missed the first couple of minutes of the talk. I may be totally off topic off topic. It would be wonderful if I could have a, a better presentation of uh, the external calls, but uh, uh, we are calling objects about which we know nothing, and uh, therefore they don't have uh, pre-post conditions, and uh, how we split uh, uh, the state uh, w w with star is not clear to me. Okay. Uh, my co-author wants to say something. In fact, it's actually a question Ralph was asking me offline anyway. 
Um, so one answer would be, which is basically what Sophia said, that, that you know, one of the great things about separation logic is you can separate out heat. So on the left hand, so one of the great things about separation logic is you can separate a heap, and you can separate it whichever way you want. And so on the left hand side, you can have uh, a field pointing to some object, and that object is on the right hand side of the star. And that's the way it works. Catch is, that protection thing that we've got there is all about saying you can't do that. If we say something is protected, we uh, need to be able, well, you know, effectively what that proves that the proofs are doing is saying no matter what else you uh, combine with the heap that our proof covers, you won't be able to do that very separation logic thing of adding in another pointer that jumps into the middle of our memory. So the question for Ralph is, or whoever else, because I've actually had this question for years and never really managed to get a, a good answer, because I don't know enough separation logic, is um, yeah, what do you do? How, how do you tackle that in separation logic? Because we'd love to know, and if not, um, we'll, we've got something else to flog you, basically. So the, by, the, by design, the, the, se the separation guarantees that there's no, there's no shared uh, ownership of memory cells, right? So if you could say that, if it's separated, then I know, I don't know what the code is, but at least I know it's not going to touch those memory cells. And so that maybe that could actually make sure that you don't um, um, basically uh, evaluate the assumptions that, uh, that are there. Yes. So what I, I yes. think that yes, is, is paramount in this uh, argument is this line should be there, because this is what the module uh, promises, and I want to be able to use it regardless of uh, the complete API of the module. This uh, some uh, uh, property uh, is preserved or, or, or weakened. Yeah. Uh, perhaps uh, some separation logic uh, nicely can help with, with these things. Uh, but I think that all these concepts have to be there. The concept that uh, I have got an assertion A before the call, and that gives me this uh, A1. And uh, then when I go into the call, I am in a different frame, so I'm lifting, and uh, the, the protection changes. These aspects would need to be there. Be there. So many people say no, no, no. No, no, so I, I wouldn't, I, I don't pretend to have the full answer to all the problems you're solving, but to, just as a comment to what uh, James was asking about, so in, in, in series, we actually do deal with this, uh, um, uh, and we do it by having a sort of characterization of what needs to be true about a certain, when forgiving a certain object to untrusted codes, uh, right? And and in, in series, in this case, you would, define that for passwords as some separation logic predicate that is incompatible with um, the, the predicate that you need for modifying the, the state of the account somehow, right? And, and you, can, you, sh you would do that by constructing some form of ghost state that allows you to express that incompatibility. Yeah? So, so, I mean... I, I, I think that the counterpart in series is that you, you uh, take the object and you, you would remove some parts of this interface in order to, to have the, uh, the, uh, the, to reflect that some capability is not around. Uh, but I think the, the capabilities, the part of the pointers to take are uh, important, let I'm sorry, I think we have to take it offline. I see in the... Yes. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, so thank you very much for the talk, Sophia. So uh, you mentioned that one of the challenges that um, you have is that you want to have an algorithmic inference system. And I assume that has to come at a trade-off of making the overall specification language weaker, right? Um, so I wanted to ask you, um, what reason do you see uh, for having this specific challenge? So uh, when I say algorithmic, I mean uh, at every step, you should know which rule you, uh, you should apply. Those rules uh, have got inference, like here. And there is more inference happening uh, here. So the specification language does not become any 
uh, weaker because of the algorithmic, but the algorithmic is very weak. It's as weak as whole logic. Whole logic is, is uh, uh, algorithmic, but uh, the inferences are not decidable. So uh, I was a, a bit uh, exaggerating when I said algorithmic. Okay, I think we should wrap up there. Let's, thanks, Sophia, again. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you, everybody. I hope that you have had an interesting day here or elsewhere. I certainly have. It remains only for us to thank uh, several people. Let's see, the Popol organization, Philippa, who suggested this meeting. Maybe we can tap all in one go. Our fine student volunteers who have fought the good fight against the IET AV system and sufficiently won. Uh, our speakers. And all of you. Thank you.